My name is Nadeem al -Haq. Let's begin our webinar today. The topic today is Pakistan's trade potential and regional comprehensive economic partnership. We've got a great panel. Um, our speaker, our keynote speaker today is Ms. Annabel Gonzalez, non-resident senior fellow, Peterson Institute for International Economics. And we've got two discussants, Dr. Mandura Ahmed, the well-known trade specialist of Pakistan. Everybody knows him. He's been working on trade issues for a long time, a WTO ambassador. Then we've got a bright young man, Mr. Hassan Khabar, former civil servant, now a major consultant in Islamabad. Um, so Hassan Khabar uh, will be the second discussant. So with that, let me call trade is our favorite subject. Let me just quickly say trade is our favorite subject. We do a lot of subjects, as, as you can expect from an economist organization. And we do a lot of trade webinars. We've done a lot of them. Quite frankly, Pakistan talks a lot about trade. We worship trade. We want to increase trade. But for the last 30 years, our trade has not increased as a percentage of GDP. We are still sitting at the same place. So I guess talk is cheap, but whether we can walk the talk or not, that's a different subject. So I think Ms. Annabel Gonzalez will tell us today what we can do about our trade potential, if we have any, I'm not convinced we have any. Regional economic partnership, very difficult because we live in a very difficult region. So can we have partnership or not? So with that, let me turn it over to Ms. Annabel Gonzalez. Annabel, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Haki. I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to be here. Uh, and uh, in particular, I appreciate very much uh, uh, your invitation uh, to speak about this, uh, this important topic. And I'm also delighted to share the uh, floor with the two speakers and uh, a, uh, also a, a, um, uh, a, a warm uh, hello to uh, Ambassador uh, Ahmad. Uh, who I had the opportunity to meet many years ago while we while we both lived in uh, in Geneva, uh, I was working at the WTO uh, at the time. So um, again, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I have to say this: this is me in Islamabad uh, uh, some some years ago uh, on uh, on the hills uh, where I had a, a great. Uh, um, a great barbecue, I have to say. So I would have preferred to be there in person, uh, but uh, but I, I hope that uh, this there would be another opportunity. And and as I said, I'm I'm grateful uh, to be here uh, this time. So on to more uh, serious uh, things. Uh, this is uh, the agenda of my presentation. I'd like to make a few key facts uh, on the uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, the RCEP. Uh, I will then look into the main features of the RCEP. I will then say a word of the uh, uh, differences between the RCEP and the other uh, big mega regional in the uh, in the in the continent, the continental preferential, the comprehensive and progressive uh, trans-Pacific partnership (CPTPP). Uh, I would then look into the implications of uh, RCEP, uh, and then in particular, what does RCEP mean for Pakistan, and then some some ideas on the way forward. Let me start by uh, mentioning a, a few key facts about uh, RCEP. Uh, we know that after um, several rounds of negotiations uh, that started in uh, 2012, uh, RCEP was signed in November uh, last year. Uh, this is an overreaching agreement that looks uh, to broaden and deepen uh, the free trade uh, agreements that were already in existence between a number of ASEAN uh, countries and existing partners, uh, what are called the, the plus three countries, China, Japan, and Korea, and also Australia and uh, New Zealand. I think that there are many reasons why RCEP is uh, significant. Uh, let me mention a couple of them. One is that this is the first mega regional trade agreement to include uh, China. Um, and second is that this is the first uh, free trade agreement between uh, China and Japan and between Japan and Korea. As we know, uh, India, who had been participating in the negotiations since the beginning, uh, decided to opt out of the negotiations and not sign the agreement uh, in November uh, last year. 
Now, together, um, our, our CEP uh, 15 participants account for uh, some 29% of uh, global GDP. Uh, it is actually, uh, in, in terms of GDP, it is actually the uh, largest uh, uh, mega regional deal in the world, even larger than uh, uh, the US-Mexico-Canada uh, agreement or the, United, uh, the EU uh, Mercosur uh, agreement. Uh, it is also large in terms of population, about a third of uh, global covering about a third of global population. And it is also large in terms of trade, in terms of uh, um, goods trade covering some 27%. Uh, of, uh, of global trade. So, so by, by almost by any measure, uh, by any metric, the RCEP is a very large uh, agreement. Now the RCEP is of course not yet into force, um, and, but it is expected uh, that it would come into force by the end of this uh, year. Uh, basically at the time when six ASEAN members uh, have um, completed their own internal procedures, uh, plus three of the other members uh, have, have completed their procedures as well. Now, let me move now a little bit to the main features of the RCEP. And uh, the starting point is that uh, the RCEP has uh, four stated objectives. The first is to establish a modern, comprehensive, high quality and mutually beneficial economic partnership framework. Um, and I will, one of the points that I think is, is very critical and I will mention this later, is that it's basically a single rule book to govern trade among the parties. Uh, it updates, as I was mentioning before, the existing agreements between ASEAN countries and some of the uh, member uh, countries. And one interesting point is that it combines what brings together uh, countries of very different level of development from uh, Japan uh, to China to Laos to Cambodia uh, and others. Second objective of RCEP is to progressive, uh, progressively liberalize and facilitate trading goods uh, among the parties, um, including some flexibilities, particularly for uh, the lesser developed members uh, within the group uh, like uh, Laos, Cambodia uh, and uh, Myanmar. It progressively liberalizes trade in services among the parties, and it creates a liberal, facilitated, and competitive investment environment in the region. Now, if we look at the content of RCEP, RCEP is a relatively comprehensive agreement. It has uh, 20 chapters. It is not what we call a deep preferential trade agreements in that a number of its provisions are relatively shallow, particularly outside of, area in, uh, of the trading goods uh, area, but it nevertheless uh, uh, represents significant progress from the existing ASEAN plus one agreement uh, because it covers a number of areas that were not covered uh, before. Now, rather than going into detail in each of the, on, uh, on each of the chapters, um, I have decided to highlight, to, to show some of the highlights uh, of the uh, agreement. And I'll start with the area of uh, trading goods, where, as I was mentioning, uh, one of the most important points about uh, RCEP is that it is a single rule book to govern trading goods among uh, the RCEP 15 members. And this is an important step in bringing the Asian continent closer uh, to a region-wide uh, trading block. The second point is that RCEP eliminates tariffs on about 90% of tariff lines, uh, uh, subject to different uh, tariff liberalization schedules that may take up to 20 years. Uh, it's also important that there are some early tariff cuts that come into force immediately uh, uh, when the agreement um, is, uh, is entered into force, uh, but that there are also some uh, carve-outs, important carve-outs for agriculture. Now, it's not, our, our service will not lead to large overall tariff uh, reductions since FTA is already in place. There are already uh, in place a number of FTAs among uh, the members. Now, interestingly, uh, there's uh, a number of countries in RCEP that adopt one tariff schedule uh, to goods imported from all other tariff, uh, uh, from all other RCEP members. Uh, and this includes Australia, Brunei, Cambodia, Malaysia, Myanmar, New Zealand, Singapore, uh, and, uh, and Thailand. Uh, the others may have different schedules that are applicable to different um, uh, uh, RCEP members. Now, 
Probably the most important feature of the RCEP is that it includes one common rule of origin for all goods created under RCEP. That is a product that meets the originating criteria under RCEP is subject to the same rules across all 15 uh, members. And this on the one hand has the potential to uh, unravel uh, the spaghetti bowl of uh, existing uh, free trade agreements in the region. But also uh, this provision in addition uh, for a provision providing for accumulation of uh, origin within RCEP is really, um, it really has the potential uh, to foster uh, significant uh, regional value chains and value addition in the region. And I will come back to this. Also, interestingly, RCEP has relatively, in, in, in most cases, it has relatively flexible rules of origin uh, with a uh, change in tariff classification or regional value content of 40% uh, percent for, for the majority of uh, tariff lines. So this basically means that uh, RCEP allows for 60% of extra RCEP uh, sourcing, which again gives um, uh, significant flexibility and flexible rules of origin are important because they have been shown uh, to promote uh, participation in global value chains. Another, in, in the same uh, sort of line, another very important uh, element of the RCEP is that there is a single certificate uh, of origin that all countries will be able to use to sell anywhere in the region, and that it also encompasses flexible documentation options, including uh, self-certification of uh, origin. And finally, Again, among the most important features of our set is enhanced trade facilitation measures, including timeframes for release of goods, for perishable goods, uh, for advanced rulings, uh, and others. Now, in the area of trading services, again, a single rule book to govern trading services and investment among our set 15 members. Uh, the RCEP adopts what is uh, normally considered to be a more liberalizing approach, although not necessarily, but a, it, it can lead to a greater liberalization approach of a negative list approach. And this is the case for uh, scheduling the market access commitments in services and investment for a number of members of RCEP, Australia, Brunei, Indonesia, Japan, Korea, Malaysia, and Singapore. The other countries use a positive list approach, that is where they specifically list the sectors or subsectors where they will open their market. Uh, but then this is while they prepare their negative list. So they are expected to transition to a negative list approach within six years of entry into RCEP. Now RCEP is not uh, uh, a, a, an agreement that opens many uh, uh, sectors in the, uh, you know, to, to does not liberalize trading services uh, in many sectors, but there is some fresh liberalization through the removal of restrictive and discriminatory measures. Now, one important um, um, provision in RCEP is that it includes what is called a ratchet mechanism, basically to lock in future unilateral liberalization for selected sectors. And if you think about countries that are in the process of uh, unilaterally liberalizing the services sector, this is an important provision. Uh, RCEP also provides for enhanced domestic regulation and transparency provision uh, in services trade. Uh, it strengthens rules on performance requirements on investment, for instance, prohibiting uh, transfer of technology uh, conditionality. And it, pro it has provisions to promote and facilitate investment uh, that are uh, that are important. In other areas, in the areas of e-commerce competition and SMEs, um, members in RCEP commit to adopt a legal framework that is conducive to e-commerce, including data privacy and consumer protection, uh, e-payments, and others. It maintains the practice of not imposing customs duties for electronic transmissions, uh, a practice that has been uh, uh, longstanding in the WTO for a while, but that gets uh, questioned every now and then. Uh, it includes limited commitments on cross-border data flows. Uh, members, uh, this is basically in the area of uh, e-commerce. In the area of competition policy, members uh, commit to adopt legislation to prescribe anti-competitive activities and to establish a competition authority. And finally, there are provisions in the area of uh, SMEs to exchange information and, uh, and foster cooperation uh, to increase SMA's uh, abilities to benefit from RCEP. 
So this again is not a full description of the agreement, but just to give you a flavor of what I think are some of its most important uh, provisions. Now, RCEP has an accession clause uh, whereby uh, it is open for accession by any country 18 months after its entry into force. Uh, so again, as I was mentioning, it is expected that it, it will probably come into force by the end of this year. So 18 months after that, uh, any country uh, could uh, um, uh, apply uh, to uh, become part of RCEP uh, and accession shall be subject to the consent of RCEP members. And of course, it's a negotiation. It will be subject to the terms and conditions that are agreed between RCEP members and the exceeding country. There is an exception for India, who, may, who as an original negotiating partner may join uh, at any time. Now, if we look at RCEP in comparison to CPTPP, we know that both are mega regional trade agreements, that there are a number of members that are that are participate in both uh, trade agreements, uh, but their breadth and depth uh, are different. RCEP is not as deep um, as uh, C CPTPP, and it's least uh, it's less comprehensive uh, on uh, on average. Here you see uh, what I think are probably the most important differences between the two, in the sense that um, CPTPP includes rules in the area of business facilitation and regulatory coherence that lead to deeper market integration. They also include uh, chapters on textiles and apparel and on state-owned enterprises and designated monopolies, uh, issues that tend to be sensitive for uh, emerging economies. And finally, they also include deeper provisions, particularly in areas like labor, uh, environment, and transparency and anti-corruption that are a key priority of civil society, particularly in advanced uh, economies as well. Now, having said this, we know that uh, although uh, uh, CPTPP is a deep uh, free trade agreement and one could characterize RCEP as more of a shallow agreement, the reality is that RCEP is bigger in economic terms uh, than CPTPP. And here we have uh, an estimation of the economic gains by Petri and Plummer uh, from uh, uh, last year. And we see they model basically two scenarios. One is sort of like business before trade wars. And in, under this scenario, the estimated um, that uh, the increase in world income uh, will be uh, close to 186 billion uh, US uh, dollars. In a scenario where the trade wars continue, uh, the gains uh, will be greater. But please notice again, at the grade, uh, the gains from RCEP uh, are uh, estimated to be uh, larger than those of uh, CPTPP. Now these gains, both in the case of RCEP and in the case of CPTPP, will basically accrue to Asia. The rest of the world also benefits, but they are, uh, yeah, the gains are, are again, mostly um, to benefit uh, countries in, uh, in the Asian region. Now, aside from these estimates, I think that the, the, the most important implications for RCEP, in my view, are the following six. First, RCEP will provide momentum to members' commitments to trade cooperation and leverage trade and investment for uh, post-pandemic economic recovery. And as we know that advanced countries continue to suffer uh, significantly from, uh, from the pandemic and, uh, and from economic uh, fallout, uh, promoting greater integration in the region or leveraging trade and investment in the region uh, will be an important driver of, uh, of a post-pandemic uh, recovery. Now, RCEP will be economically significant as we have mentioned and indeed more than uh, CPTPP. RCEP will reorient trade and economic ties uh, uh, away from global linkages towards regionally focused uh, relations uh, in uh, East Asia. The development and expansion of regional supply chains will be encouraged as a result of a streamlined customs procedures, the unified rules of origin and improved market access. Importantly as well, value addition in the region will be facilitated by lower cost for companies with cross-regional chains um, uh, across and facilitated by this common rules of origin. And finally, I think the region will attract significant investment flows uh, encouraged by an enabling conducive environment and lower trade costs. 
Now, what does this mean for Pakistan? Well, on the one hand, of course, uh, there are uh, RCEP poses a number of risks uh, to Pakistan, uh, one of them being potential export losses from being left out. Uh, in this table here, we see that I think Pakistan exports to RCEP countries represent some 15 or 16 percent of, uh, of, um, of uh, total exports of Pakistan. And Pakistan will face increased competition for specific products uh, in the different uh, in the different markets, as other competitors from Pakistan will be able to um, not only um, uh, enter the market under preferential conditions or you know uh, with the elimination of tariffs, but also uh, under more uh, uh, under very favorable rules of origin uh, conditions. Uh, Pakistan may also face a uh, potential investment diversion, particularly because I think RCEP will attract a great interest, uh, will attract the great interest of, uh, of investors, and they will tend to look into the countries that are part of RCEP and not necessarily to those countries that are not uh, part of RCEP. But more broadly, I think that the, uh, the most important risk for Pakistan is really missing out on the benefits of deeper trade integration and the potential that this has for improving export competitiveness, uh, creating high quality jobs uh, and increasing uh, productivity gains. Now, RCEP is also an opportunity for Pakistan and particularly I would say the most important opportunity would be for Pakistan to join a mega regional trade deal that could help expand Pakistan networks of FTAs uh, to support participation in global and regional supply chains. That is, rather than negotiating one FTA at a time, uh, Pakistan can enter into this broader negotiation and help and expand its network of FTAs, which is still relatively uh, uh, limited. It could inject new momentum to Pakistan's export strategy to increase and diversify uh, exports. It could help enhance export competitiveness uh, through reduced uh, trade costs uh, and access to competitive inputs, uh, which I think is particularly critical um, uh, to uh, join uh, supply chains. It can help also um, simplify, bring greater transparency and predictability uh, in trade policy making. Again, an important uh, topic um, uh, for business uh, certainty. It can help reduce uh, tariffs with, uh, importantly, uh, phase out periods and also uh, trade remedies that could help manage the transition towards, towards greater openness. It can help reverse the decline in investment uh, flows. It could expand and deepen the connection to regional supply chains for all the reasons that I have mentioned. And um, it can also boost the competitiveness of the services sector to support diversified exports and more broadly, reignite the reform uh, drive on uh, trade and investment. So to conclude, let me just share with you some ideas on the way forward. I, I then this comes from, I, I, I led the negotiation of a number of free trade agreements in my own country, Costa Rica, with the US, with the European Union, uh, also participated in the implementation of the agreement with China and with other agreements in, um, uh, and other FTAs. And I think one way to think about this is first to look in the, into detail on the content and the implications of RCEP for Pakistan at the, at the tariff level, at the sectoral level, maybe establish an institutional unit in the Ministry of Commerce uh, to develop a strategy uh, to, um, for potential accession for Pakistan, for studying Pakistan's potential accession to RCEP, including reaching out to private sector and civil society, identifying offensive and defensive interests, uh, because every country, of course, has uh, different offensive and defensive interests uh, in, uh, in a potential accession process, uh, learn from other RCEP members on their experience in negotiating uh, RCEP. RCEP is a challenging agreement, of course, particularly for some of the members. So it, it would be interesting to learn from them in their negotiating experience, reaching out to RCEP members, of course, to also express uh, interest in, um, in accession, and then developing a roadmap uh, for accession. Again, uh, provided, of course, that there is uh, the political will uh, and interest uh, to move in this direction. So with this, again, I thank you for the opportunity and I look forward uh, to the comments uh, from, uh, from the uh, other speakers in this panel and of course to answering any questions.
Thank you very much. I think you're muted, uh, Nadim. Nadim, doctor. Apologies, apologies, apologies. Thank you, thank you, Annabelle. Thank you very much. Thank you for a great overview of RCEP. This was very informative. Mandur Sahib, I'll go to you. And let me ask you a simple question. Um, first, of course, you tell us about this RCEP, what you think of it. And uh, but I'd like to know, I mean, do we have the capacity to do all that Annabelle is saying? She's put out a huge agenda. Um, we don't have the capacity to even analyze our own economy or, or even think about anything. Besides, this seems to be a huge, I mean, what are these regional trade agreements doing? WTO was set up in UNCTAD, I remember when I was a baby, and although I'm a young man, but not that young, so it was supposed to be free trade around the world. Now we've got a set of regional trade agreements that are only benefiting lawyers and nobody else. I mean, uh, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing there in WTO? Mandur Sahib, over to you. Okay, thank you very much and uh, very nice, Annabelle. You gave uh, first, uh, very pleased to connect with you, and you gave a very, very good overview. You didn't leave anything for chance or for us. <laughs> so, thank you very much. You explained it very well. Uh, uh, Dr. Nadimulak, your questions. I mean, there are two things. One is whether we have the capacity, but I think that's secondary. First thing is whether we have the intention to go there. Pakistan has locked itself in. I mean, they, they're just, uh, you know, first they have to, I mean, look at um, uh, Annabel comes from, from Costa Rica, a small country. And I think they have a free trade agreement with almost everybody, all 50 countries, I think, something like that. And almost uh, 80, 90% of their goods come, to, uh, their trade is with, with those countries. Pakistan, did the very kind of uh, what well, we did with Singapore, uh, no, uh, Sri Lanka, uh, 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 and, and not very expensive, but okay, uh, still uh, good enough. But then we did with, with China. And since then, we are just stuck. Although on paper, we do have FTAs with Malaysia, with Indonesia, but, but they're just, just fig leaves. We say, okay, We'll allow your palm oil at this, uh, some concession, and you allow our, our rice, and doesn't even cover 10% of the tariff. I mean, they're, they're not uh, FTAs. Even, even with China, I think we are, all our uh, industry is almost hidden from competition, whether it's auto or whether it's steel or whether it's, it's, it's textile. But, but the country is up against FTAs after having done this with, with China. Because uh, I think it was a mistake for the first thing, because China is in any event very, very competitive. And, and we, even with tariffs, it was difficult. And we picked the first country to go to is, is China. And that should not have been done. But now that uh, that's done. Uh, and Nadim's second question, then I ask a question from Annabelle. Um, uh, with, with WTO, it has become. Um, unwieldy and unmanageable with over 150 members and then the, the negotiating system and a big agenda and they say unless you have to agree on everything and and then the uh, you know the word has changed and the uh, definition of developing countries China India all these big economies they still want to be developing countries and other countries say now that you have a seat on the table you're no more a developing country let, let that be for some african countries and others so uh, i think and wto kind of uh, has become unmanageable and that's why we have these fta's all around but but it doesn't matter you know you could stay with wto there are lots of good points with wto because dispute settlement all these even if it's asean whether rcep or or um, the Canada, Mexico, you, you, whatever they call it now, NEFTA, whatever. So they are they still go to WTO for their distribution. So WTO has this still plus points. They just recently this is, uh, did this trade facilitation agreement. So they will be doing bits and pieces here. But the big thing, big benefit is going to come through um, uh, these regional trade. Unfortunately, the only regional trade 
uh, we are uh, a significant regional trade is in, in this, what we call the South Asian free trade. But since we don't have any relationship with India, so that that is almost zero. I mean, that, that doesn't exist. But Pakistan should realize that uh, the trading patterns have changed. It's no more the old system. You produce shirt and you, you take it somewhere and, and you sell it. Is the now value chains and you have to get into value chains and for getting into value chains and lots of other important things like rules of origin and and you have to let things come in and add value and send them out and, and you know the, all, the the trading patterns have completely changed so Pakistan have to adjust now my question to and was and then maybe I come back later and I you see. How, you know, all the countries that are now part of, uh, uh, other than ASEAN, is ASEAN plus one. I mean, they became, it was easy because they already had a free trade agreement with, with ASEAN. So ASEAN plus one, they all became this thing. But how difficult would it be for other countries? Would it be something like what we, um, you know, when countries try to enter WTO, and uh, sometimes it's a very lengthy process. Even China took 14 years and some take 10 years and nine years. And so we, we cannot even start the negotiation process in another two, three years. But one, and, and then I see another problem. Since all the way you explained it, every country, uh, every member of RCEP has to agree. And, and India has been given this um, special um, uh, treatment that you can join any time. Huh? So once India is in, I think it would be extremely difficult for Pakistan to, to make its way. I stop here. Nadeem, Thank back you. to you. Hassan Khabar. Hassan Khabar, tell us, how will we work our way through this international rigmarole? We are trying to deregulate domestically and we re-regulate all the time because of the global pressure. I, I think the world has gone wild with bureaucracy. Will we ever be able to trade again? So Dr. Nadeem, uh, thank you so much for inviting me to this uh, August panel. And I'll start with your earlier statement that do we have the, even have the capacity to navigate our way through this rigmarole, the, the term you used. I think whether we choose to uh, be part of RCEP at some point or whether we choose not to, I think either way, not having the capacity is not an option. Because you can look at RCEP in two ways, and I think Annabelle has rightly shown both sides, right? So, of course, there is glass half empty and glass half full. When you look at the glass half empty, you realize that your relative market access could suffer. Uh, you, you, can, you can lose uh, your exports to some of your competitors uh, in the region. Uh, you can also lose some investments. Uh, who knows, you may also lose out on some potential BRI financing. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, there is the glass half full. And I think uh, one of the slides, uh, Annabelle, caught my attention that the, the, the threshold for regional value content is quite low, which means there's still space to have 60% content from elsewhere. And when you look at R7, I'm not a trade expert, I think there are other flexibilities in rules of origin. Uh, there are uh, this uh, change in tariff heading rules. There are process rules, which kind of leaves a lot of room for other countries to plug into these uh, regional value chains. So I think we also ha have a glass half full. Now, in terms of FTA or RCEP, I think more than the difficulties in the FTA, because Dr. Manzoor mentioned the first phase of FTA, and then we recently signed the second phase of FTA with China, I think more than what is in those trade agreement, uh, what, what is more important is what do we do with the, the, those FTAs? So once we sign a trade agreement, we pretty much leave them uh, for our businesses to take benefit from. And then we think that these agreements are static. So when we signed an agreement with China, we did not kind of very quickly renegotiate when ASEAN signed an agreement with China. And then uh, I think the real question is if these FTAs really translate into our industrial policy, into our investment policy, what kind of incentives are we giving to our industries? So I think that again also is a problem. I think right now, uh, Pakistan is at crossroads. 
And I think for once we have to decide whether we want to keep on living with a culture of protectionism or whether we are open to uh, integration. And I think if we go for integration, I think it's going to be a difficult journey. And I think no political government would want to go that route. But I think the more we delay it, the riskier it would get. Because I think, um, and Annabelle, you mentioned that maybe it's not as ambitious on tariff liberalization, but I think what RCEP has an immense potential for is to really bring Asia together, is to really uh, center a lot of investment, a lot of trade within the region. And what's happening in the rest of the world, we know. We know the US-China trade war. We know all these trading blocks. So very soon, I think Pakistan uh, and other countries which are going uh, with options like Pakistan, that mentality are going to be isolated. So I think the sooner we embrace the concept of integration, the better we'd be. Uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. Uh, capacity would be needed, but I think all of these are secondary considerations. I think as a country, um, we need to decide that we are ready for that. And this is not a political issue and we need to build a consensus. And then I think bring a fundamental shift to not only how we look at the FTAs, but also how we look at investment policies, industrial policies, how we are looking at our SEZs, how we are dealing with our uh, um, uh, import SROs, our custom policy and everything. So this is what I believe should do, we should do. Great, wonderful. Thank you. Um, Annabelle, let's go back to you. You've got these discussions issues to take up. I'll go to the floor later. Um, so what would you say to some of these issues? Mm -hmm. I would argue that countries like Pakistan have no option but just to open up and forget about the free trade agreements. <clears throat> because right now, we are getting very contradictory advice, Annabelle. On the one side, you tell us join free trade agreements. On the other side, we, you tell us, uh, you know, for example, put in more controls because you've got all kinds of international agreements with controls. What does a poor country like Pakistan do without capacity, without anything? We are just meandering through international trade agreements. We are meandering through consultants. We are meandering through international advice. I don't think we can get anywhere like this. So thank you very much for, uh, I think for all the comments, I, I have to th say that uh, I think that they're, they're, they're right on point in, in, in many different ways. So let me, let me maybe make a, a, a few <laughs> reflections uh, uh, based on them. The first one is that I agree with the point that uh, Hassan was making that not having uh, capacity is not really an option or should not be the driver, you know, for for decision making in this area because um, capacity uh, can be developed uh, and uh, and you know to a certain degree, uh, starting with a, a negotiation such as RCEP uh, is much more manageable than starting with uh, you know a negotiation of a deeper uh, preferential uh, agreement. So I think you know capacity. While challenging, and you know, I, I I come from a developing country myself, and I've I've been to many developing countries. Challenge capacity is 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 always uh, an issue, uh, but again, I think can can be built, and uh, you know, there are forms also to supplement or complement and support uh, the the capacity build, the uh, building process. The second point that I want to uh, reflect on is, you know. The decision, uh, again, Hassan was making a very good point. So the decision, I think, that Pakistan uh, has been facing for a while, but, but, uh, but it's even more, uh, I think, evident right now is, you know, it's sort of like at a, at a crossroads. Does it continue uh, along the route of uh, uh, protectionism or, you know, does it begin to embrace uh, uh, a more open uh, trade regime? In the absence of RCEP, I would argue that in the absence of RCEP and in the absence of CPTPP, uh, this, I mean, being isolated is, uh, is, is, is difficult. But in the context of regional integration agreements that are being in the region, even, you know, closer, even more closer together uh, with regional value chains, uh, I, I think they're going to, you know, they're going to boom in a, in a similar way, in a similar way after a few years. 
as what the European Union is today in the sense, uh, in, in the sense that regional value chains are a very important part. Intra-EU trade is a very important part of trade in, the, in, uh, in Europe. I think intra uh, RCEP trade uh, will become increasingly relevant. So not being part of that will put Pakistan, in my view, in a very challenging uh, position. And the longer it remains isolated, the more difficult um, it, it will become because there's also a, a big push coming uh, out of this agreement and they generate a lot of attention, a lot of investment. So it's better to be there you know, sooner rather than later. So Mansoor uh, asked a very important question, uh, which is um, you know, when, when India uh, uh, becomes a part of RCEP, then it would be very challenging for Pakistan. And I, I, that of course uh, is the case. I, I have to say that even though India has an open door, my sense is that it is not likely that India will become a part of RSF soon, uh, which means that there is a window of opportunity. Uh, there is a window of, uh, of opportunity to express interest, to begin preparations and to reach out uh, to members. Now, I have to say that I think this negotiations would be difficult. Uh, uh, Mansoor was asking the question, will this be difficult? I have to say, this will be very difficult. I, I, you know, I tell you, my own country uh, negotiated, one of the agreements that we negotiated was uh, with the United States uh, and the other Central American countries. This was extremely difficult, uh, not only from the technical perspective, but most importantly, from the political economy uh, perspective, uh, because this meant in, in this particular case, the opening up of monopolies in the area of trading services that was extremely difficult for the country. I think for a country like Pakistan, entering into negotiations with all of RCEP will be challenging. I have to say, the, the fact that uh, Pakistan already has an agreement, albeit, albeit you know, uh, partial or incomplete with China, uh, it's a stepping stone. Uh, it's a stepping stone because you know, China is of course a very big participant in, in, in RCEP. Uh, so, so that part is at least partially uh, covered. Now, there are other countries in, in, uh, in RCEP that also faced challenges in this negotiation. And this is why I think reaching out to learning about their experience uh, is something that could be beneficial uh, to, to Pakistan. Um, so the other point uh, Hassan made is that, you know, negotiating trade agreements is, is very relevant, but it is also very relevant to develop the capabilities uh, in the private sector, the programs, the capacity to attract investment, to promote exports, uh, to support linkages, um, so that the private sector can take advantage uh, of, this, uh, of this agreement. And I think that this is something, again, that is very, very um, important. So I want to conclude by saying that if, if one looks at this from a pragmatic perspective, um, and setting aside a little bit the political economy, which I am sure is very, very challenging. If one looks at this from a pragmatic perspective and one thinks, okay, so RCEP will, be a, will come into force, let's say by the end of 2021. Mm -hmm. So a country uh, can take you know, 2021 and 2022 uh, to prepare for these negotiations. And you know, this, this can follow a very detailed roadmap along the lines of some of the points that I mentioned before. It can, it can uh, also uh, you know, be used to build the political consensus that will be required uh, to, you know, to move forward with such, a, with such an important uh, endeavor. So it's not that this is something that needs to be done you know, uh, tomorrow in a hurry, but there is time to prepare. Uh, what I think would be terrible for Pakistan is not to, not to make a decision, continue to, uh, you know, to linger with investment, um, you know, not doing very good or exports not doing very good, um, while the other countries continue to modernize, to update their regimes, to integrate further. And, you know, maybe five years from now or six years from now, you know, Pakistan looks at RCEP and sort of says, hmm, you know, it, it, it's a missed opportunity uh, uh, not to be part of this. So, so this is why I want to be so, so sort of a, a, a vocal, if you wish, in saying that this is a very important moment for reflection uh, as to what type of economy 
uh, Pakistan wants for the future in a context of the world that is not less integrated, but in a context of a world that is increasingly integrated in the region of the world that's gonna drive growth uh, and where the post-pandemic recovery will be stronger. So, so it, is, it is indeed a very important uh, uh, sort of decision, I think. Yes, Annabel, I agree. We've been facing these decisions for the last 70 years. And unfortunately, the decisions keep moving. Today is to RCEP or not to RCEP. Previously, it was F to FTA or not to FTA. Then it was to India or not to India. Then it was to China or not to China. But we muddle along. We are not going to change. But let me go to the floor. Um, trade and investment. Who is trade and investment, babe? Trade and investment. Who is this? Introduce yourself, please, and then quickly. Sir, this is Shafiq Shahzad. i an hour, so please go quickly. Uh, this is Shafiq Shahzad, sir. Uh, I'm Trade Investment Minister, Pakistan High Commission, London. Okay, good. Uh, sir, a uh, uh, few comments uh, and a question as well. First of all, uh, somebody says that do we have the capacity of negotiating a free trade, trade agreement? Uh, kind of a rebuttal that yes sir we do have the capacity and we have demonstrated that by negotiating a very well articled articulated second phase of china pakistan fta uh, hassan and dr manzoo were bm me out that 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 is the best deal which any country can can you know negotiate with a big giant like china uh, we renegotiated uh, pta with indonesia got best deals and we started negotiating with Thailand and Turkey, but we didn't do that because the deals were not good. So we pursued the notion of uh, not to, you know, it's better not to have a, a deal than having a bad deal. Now, the other comment is uh, with regard to RCEP, uh, my observation is that do we have a choice to become, uh, uh, to become a member or to negotiate? Uh, to my understanding, we do not have any option. Only the countries which have acquired the full dialogue partner status with ASEAN, only those countries have the privilege to, to become member of ASEP. And since Pakistan missed the train back in 1994, and Pakistan is just a partial dialogue partner, at this point in time, Pakistan cannot become a member of ASEAN, despite whether we like it or not. Uh, yes, we can approach them. Uh, we had done that, but they have uh, imposed a moratorium on that, and they are not going to expand full dialogue membership for any other country. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we have lost the train. Uh, we cannot become member at this in point in time. Uh, but the other comment is, even mm -hmm. if they agree to, you know, to make Pakistan member, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Manzoor Saab would bear me out mm -hmm. that negotiating, uh, becoming part of an agreement which has already been done would be a very difficult proposition. It's always good to negotiate and become member at the outset, or it's always good to negotiate separate agreements. To me, I think uh, the option or the policy uh, you know, proposals which Pakistan can pursue at this point in time is that they should negotiate individual FTAs instead of going for an RCEP, which will be a very difficult proposition. And I can see that it includes transparency, investment services, and some of the very sensitive sectors, which are very sensitive to Pakistan. The, the best remedy for Pakistan would be that it should negotiate FTAs with individual partners instead of becoming a member of, uh, member of RCEP, which will be a very difficult proposition. Thank it, you. It, thank you. Uh, Annabel, can you just hold on to these questions? I'll just come back to you. I, I hope to get you free in 10 minutes. Let me just quickly go to the others. Habib Ahmed. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Huck, for giving me the floor. And uh, a big hello to Annabel. I'm also one of our colleagues from the Geneva days. Uh, just a few comments and questions basically addressed to most of the speakers. I've heard it with a keen interest what others had to say. Now, uh, one thing which I would wish to know from, the, from this August panel is that what has been the fate of the existing FTAs? Vis-a-vis, uh, -vis, uh, of course, I mean, we can look at it in silos also. We have uh, a number of FTAs with individual countries. So what has been the fate? Secondly, what I feel is that uh, 
do we need to fall into this trap of being uh, a part of a regional uh, um, regional uh, arrangement when i mean i i tend to agree with the previous speaker that maybe it's much more easier for us to be uh, doing these negotiations with individual countries and getting into ftas and trying to get the best of it one of the reasons why i say so is that and 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 dr manzoor had definitely alluded to this uh, issue of productive capacity we do not have the productive capacity even if we are able to negotiate good market access terms do we have the capacity to avail of these market access opportunities uh, secondly one thing which comes into my mind is that maybe uh, for pakistan at the present stage regionalism could be more of a tumbling block rather than a building block so these are just one or two comments i of course i had many others in my mind but due to the interest of time i'll just stop at that thank you sir thank you very much for doing it mohammad umar sir uh, assalam alaikum wa alaikum assalam go ahead hello go ahead yes uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, i thank the distinguished uh, panelist mm -hmm. uh, my question uh, sir is since a bird uh, in the hand for can you just you, briefly where you are from what do you, what do you do yeah can you hear me we can hear you very well go ahead mm -hmm. yeah since a bird in uh, in the hand is worth two in the bush uh, mm -hmm. how is uh, pakistan uh, integrating uh, how is pakistan making uh, success the uh, china pakistan economic corridor mm -hmm. Uh, which is part of uh, Belt and Road Initiative, and how uh, would RCEP uh, be integrated into that? Thank you. Good. Okay, I'll come back to you, Annabel. Now we've got uh, a few questions for you. Go ahead. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Nadim, and thanks uh, to, uh, to to all of the participants for the comments. Uh, and uh, hello to uh, Habib as well. Um, so, I do think. Of course, one option for Pakistan is to uh, pursue uh, individual FTAs rather than a regional uh, agreement like RCEP. And by the way, uh, RCEP is indeed open to any um, uh, state uh, that approaches the members, provided that the members agree uh, on initiating negotiations with that uh, country, and of course, under the terms and conditions that are uh, that are negotiated. So RCEP is indeed an open block, not necessarily um, uh, only for uh, countries that are part of ASEAN. So it is uh, correct that um, Pakistan could opt for bilateral FTAs, negotiating bilateral FTAs, rather than being part of a regional agreement. But in doing that, it will lose the benefits of the regional supply chain dimension of RCEP, which is this one common rule, uh, this one single certificate of origin, uh, all these aspects that are gonna reduce uh, trade costs significantly uh, in the region. So I think that from this perspective, uh, while the individual FTAs are, you know, can also be beneficial, being part of this broader scheme uh, would be much more significant uh, in terms of uh, impact. Um, now, uh, the one important element also to bear in mind is that this is not an agreement uh, that would um, uh, force Pakistan, you know, to bring down tariffs immediately on all tariff lines at entry into force. This is an agreement that would uh, include a tariff liberalization schedule that is to be negotiated among the parties that provides for the possibility of keeping exclusions should, should the parties would uh, want to go in that uh, direction. And it includes a number of flexibilities uh, to deal with the particular situation of, uh, of uh, member countries. So I think that, you know, if, if you ask me, could Pakistan be ready to be part of CPTPP, for example, I would say that would, pro that would probably be a, a very tough endeavor. But part of RCEP, I think could be feasible because of the, you know, of, of, of the sort of less ambitious nature, if you wish, uh, of, uh, of uh, RCEP, but still very, very uh, relevant. Um, so uh, on, on the question of, uh, you know, and does Pakistan, uh, Habib was saying, does Pakistan, you know, is, is, is Pakistan uh, has to fall into the trap of regional integration? I would sort of frame it the, the other way, which is that I think 
RCEP is opening the opportunity to Pakistan uh, to basically, you know, connect to, to, to a very powerful machine of regional value chains. Uh, and this is an opportunity that, you know, that doesn't come about that, uh, that easily. So, so, so my sense is that RCEP is, is really, you know, comes as a, as, as a major opportunity for Pakistan that of course would be very challenging, would require a lot of preparation, but it provides, uh, it seems to provide the instruments to be, you know, to manage it in a way uh, that could be, um, uh, that, that, that could, you know, could, could work for, uh, for Pakistan. Um, so, and just a quick uh, comment on, uh, 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 on Mohammed's uh, uh, question on whether RCEP uh, underpins the Belt and Road Initiative. I don't, I don't think that, you know, formally, uh, formally not, but it is true that it will be a very important complement to the Belt and Road Initiative because it provides sort of like the trade and investment framework uh, to underpin uh, the investments that are done under the, under the initiative. So in, it seems to be something that, you know, it goes in parallel uh, and could be mutually supportive if you wish. Great, thank you very much. Annabel, you wanted to leave in an hour. So certainly, thank you, thank you. It's been wonderful. We've um, learned a lot and it's important to look into RCEP. I hope some of our young researchers from Biden and other places will start looking at RCEP, start doing the kind of studies that you mentioned, because it's important to understand these, these things and it's important to be uh, you know, aware of what's happening in the world, or it's only then that we can have the capacity or the willingness to negotiate. So I think that the process begins with some research and some understanding. So I would urge all our young researchers to at least get into the subject and try and find out what it is. Try and understand these things. It's far too complex for me to understand, but I think young researchers should do it. And hopefully we will develop the capacity. So thank you very much, Annabelle. Uh, Dr. Manzoor Hassan, Maybe we'll take a few more questions and um, you know, use you, this occasion to learn from you while you're here and uh, proceed. So thank you, Annabel. And I'll go to Mohammed Khurram, I think. Mohammed Khurram, bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much to all. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, good evening. Um, hey. Sorry, do you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. So um, I just want to say that it's, it was a wonderful webinar. Mm -hmm. everything so i just want to add something in the end that so in my thinking like it's really important to join rc ep fta all sort of trade agreements and we don't really have any choice however we are talking about the capacity okay so in my thinking it's never about the capacity but what i think it's not, never about the capacity okay. it's all about and always have been about the offer and what we as a nation can offer okay and the question should be that can we give can we do we have a good offer can we like give any good offer to whatever like the trade agreement it is and what in return we can get so so in my thinking sir we, we, the question should be that do we have any good offer to give in order to have a good negotiation that's i will say that we have to see all this. Thank you. Anybody else, folks? Thank you, sir. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. Who is this? Sayyid Fahim? Sayyid Fahim Raza, I think. Sayyid Fahim Raza. So can you hear me, sir? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Uh, sir, I want to ask a question that how can we narrate that uh, economic security is key to national security? Okay, fair enough. Gonzalo, Gonzalo is the person who helped us organize this. Uh, so I should bring in Gonzalo. Absolutely, Gonzalo, please. I, uh, it's my mistake. I forgot to mention this is an IMF, sorry, World Bank, PID joint webinar. I apologize for that, Gonzalo. In my rush no to start, way. I forgot that. So Gonzalo, please, yes, go ahead, absolutely. No worries. I, I have one comment uh, related to um, a question of a previous uh, participant that was mentioning, what do we know about existing uh, FTAs uh, that Pakistan has? Uh, have they worked, have they not? Uh, and so I think I, I echo what Dr. Mansour said before, many of these FTAs are extremely narrow in scope, right? 
Uh, so there's, there's not much to gain uh, from them. But if one looks at the China-Pakistan FTA, that is probably the, the, the one that is, that is least narrow, right? That is broader in scope. Um, I think there has been a narrative constructed uh, based on, on a very uh, Trumpian view of the world, right? And uh, that is, let's look at the bilateral trade uh, balance and if Pakistan has a, a surplus in that bilateral, so if Pakistan is exporting more to China than China exports to Pakistan, then we are gaining from it. And if the reverse is happening, then we are losing. And I would suggest this is a, a flawed way of looking at this. Mm -hmm. One of the things we did, uh, this is when I, just, when I first joined the, the program here in, in, in Islamabad, was to look at how, uh, you know, more integration with China. So what it did for, for competitiveness in Pakistan. And one of the things that we found is that sectors in Pakistan, exporters from Pakistan that use more inputs that were increasingly coming from China at lower prices because of the FDA did better in third countries. So I'm gonna give you one example. And one example that I like using is the example of refrigerators sold to Afghanistan. So Pakistani exporters selling refrigerators to Afghanistan because they were able to buy compressors from China at lower prices. So that's an example of a regional value chain. You get the compressors, you sell to Afghanistan. And, and this is quite systematic evidence actually on how cheaper inputs from China facilitated the exports of Pakistani products to other countries. Uh, so that's a, one example, but I think echoing also what you were saying, Nadim, this is an area in which five researchers or researchers from any other institution should be quite a lot of, of work to understand whether that is gaining and how from this idea. Over. Great, thank you. Jasmine? Jasmine. Si, Aslam alaikum. Please introduce yourself, Ji. Uh, yes, consultant at uh, the Ministry of Commerce. Okay. So um, uh, I was just wondering that, for example, just like the uh, within the ASEAN member states, mm -hmm. some of these countries like uh, CMLV, uh, Cambodia, Myanmar, Laos, and uh, Vietnam, they have a special status, so they don't have to reciprocate in terms of you know tariff reduction modalities and duties and so on on the and 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 the and the product coverage. Um, so the max that we have gone to is like with China. Uh, where we've liberalized 75% of, of the tariff lines. So I was wondering that the, in, within RCEP, the ASEAN, the plus nations, do China has, South Korea has. So if Pakistan um, is to enter RCEP, because you see Japan and China are seeking to uh, liberalize trade, liberalize even, you know, go for deeper integration. They want a 90, 95% of liberalization within RCEP. So if that is to happen and we're, expect, we're expected to liberalize to that extent, I, I don't know if the plus nations would also, uh, they would allow the plus nations to have a status such as the CLMV. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you. G, Dr. Shahid, Dr. Shahid Konaji. Dr. Shahid, please. G. Dr. Shahid. Uh, am I audible to you people? You are, indeed. Uh, sir, I am uh, Shahid and I have a PhD degree in economics from FIDE. I am your student. Okay. Back okay. in 2009. Uh, basically, I want to, uh, uh, I have some questions. The person uh, or one of the participants, uh, I think Trade and Investment Minister from Pakistani High Commission in London, Mm -hmm. And uh, he was uh, sort of save in, uh, doing uh, or giving their rebuttal about the capacity of our trade ambassadors or our trade consul, counselors. So if you people have the capacity, if you have, if you people have the ability uh, to developing all those linkages and uh, uh, trade relations, then why the overall trade with the rest of the world is not improving? Why we have this stagnancy in exports and uh, why the trade relationship with the rest of the world is not improving. So if we uh, people are the <laughs> Minister of Commerce Industry is, ha, has the capacity, so rather than giving a battle, why are you not giving a statistic that uh, uh, we have the capacity and this is why our exports are improving 
our trade relationship with the rest are uh, with the rest of the world is improving. So we have these stagnancy. So good question. Is, uh, good question. Good question. Right. Let's let's get back to them. If 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 the Ministry of Commerce and the Trade Investment uh, Investment Minister wants to answer these questions, sure, please do. Otherwise, uh, anybody else, or I'll go back to Manzoor Saab. Manzoor Saab, how would you respond to all these questions? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, I'll respond to uh, oh, four or five that I've taken note. First, Dr. Nadim, your your question that Pakistan should maybe forget about these uh, regional and, and, and other FTAs and, and just do it unilaterally. That would be great, but they're not mutually exclusive. Once you have done some uh, domestic reforms, it's much easier to do it, but it's very difficult, very difficult to do it unilaterally. So that's why many countries go through either this regional route that forces them to open up, they you know, Turkey and many others, they, they, they open through the regional route, or they go through the multilateral route so that this thing. Unfortunately, Pakistan has been hiding from all these. They, it became a part of SEFTA, but refused to open up. So, and, and, and at the WTO, it would take any concession and hide itself and not, not do any you know, there have been several rounds of, uh, the, and, and the, the, Pakistan's uh, attitude has been not to do any reform, but just to hide. Uh, uh, for example, we have, say, uh, you know, our tariff rate is 25%. To the WTO, we say it's 75. That's the bound rate. So for every, all our goods, we add another 50 so that, you know, by any chance, we don't have to reduce it. My okay. The next is Shafiq Shahzad. He said about the, the capacity. Yes, I think I, I think by uh, Ministry of Commerce and especially when Shafiq was there, they made a lot of progress. They they very good capacity and and with automation they have all the data. They they do these uh, all these things, and uh, I think the problem is there is a problem, but but the more problem is at the political level. Somebody has to let them do it. And there's always that rocket. Um, but I, um, my difference with Shafiq Shahzad, he, he gave a very um, pessimistic picture about Pakistan never being able to join. I, I think there, there is some, some um, what should I say, gunjaish uh, there, so it's not, not that uh, good. Um, then there was Khurum um, Shabir. He said, uh, uh, "It is um, uh, what, what, you know. If we if we make a good offer, maybe we can in return that. That is extremely difficult for Pakistan because they are. We are used to like there's a psyche like like the, you know there was I think the Yasmin asked that question like LDCs. We are always looking." for GSP type, uh, unilateral. Somebody should give us some concession. Don't ask us anything. You can put some other conditions like human rights and others and make us very humiliating conditions. We will go for it. But we don't want to give any, in return, any market concession. That's our you know, uh, uh, psyche. We, we are just like LDCs have the same and Pakistan does the same thing. Um, okay, Dr. Uh, uh, Shahid said about why is there stagnancy? It's, it's, it's not really, it's more to do with our political bigger decisions. If you look at any country, there was um, a, a political decision to open up and there was some catalyst in the, in the cabinet or somewhere. And, and if, if they were fortunate to have him, for him, him or her for a long time, that worked very well. Uh, for example, India, uh, when Dr. Manmohan Singh became, became uh, finance minister and then the prime minister. So there was a long run of 15, 20 years, 15 years at least. And so he pushed gradually and India opened up. It's the same thing. You look at any country, there was uh, um, uh, Turkey, for example, Turgut Ozal was, um, he, he continued for many years and, and opened up. And unfortunately, we never had in, in Pakistan any consistency or any one real champion of opening up the trade. That, that's been our problem. I think I stop here and uh, maybe I come back if I, later on. Okay, if, if... Afan Khamer. So Dr. Nadeem, I think Dr. Manzoor has pretty much answered all questions, but I would just like to take up that uh, capacity question. 
I think the discussion that happened previously was in a narrower context. And I think the question is that whether Pakistan has the capacity to negotiate FTAs. And I think to that question, uh, to the best of my understanding, Shafiq said that we do have that capacity and I would endorse that. Because we have a fairly decent commerce and trade service. They are good professionals. They know how to look at trade agreements. They know how to negotiate. And I think that's fine. Now, are these trade agreements enough to uh, improve Pakistan's trade balance? I think that's another debate altogether. So even if we have the capacity to negotiate trade agreement, it may not lead to improvement in our trade balance because there are other pieces of the puzzle that we need to uh, bring in. And I would like to quote an example that even if you look at the uh, China-Pakistan free trade agreement phase one that was signed in 2006 or seven, right after that, there was an improvement in our trade balance for about a year before uh, the ASEAN-China uh, FTA was signed. So I think we live in a dynamic world where things are changing. And right now, uh, Pakistan uh, signed another uh, round of FTA and we, we did a report on that. And I think it's a fairly decent free trade agreement. But now there is RCEP and RCEP would also take precedence. So I think things change and uh, the government needs to constantly look at these agreements. I think we are lucky in a way that RCEP is not that ambitious in terms of tariff liberalization because if it were, uh, we would have taken a more serious hit. Uh, so I think we do have capacity in Pakistan. Uh, that capacity does exist in pockets, uh, but I think it somehow does not translate into meaningful results, which is an irony, but I think that's the, that's the fact. Hmm. Okay, very good. Uh, Dr. Manzoor, before we go, um, who is this? Dr. Murtaza. Dr. Murtaza, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nadeem Saab. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank PAIT and World Bank, of course, for organizing these seminars and giving us the opportunity to, to participate and to attend. I have a simple question from Dr. Dr. Manzoor. Sorry, you can introduce yourself. That'll be very good. Uh, yeah, I'm Dr. Murtaza Sato, Associate Professor, Department of Economics, Agriculture University, Tando Jam Sindh. Great, wonderful. Good to have you here. Ji. Thank you. Manzoor Saab, uh, my, my question is that is it the case that due to the political economy issues Pakistan is hiding, hiding itself mm. or there are some more strong reasons mm. uh, and do we have the political will to join these FTAs or RCEP or uh, other agreements, trade agreements? Thank you. Good question, good question. Achaji, um, anybody else? Okay, otherwise I'll just go back to the uh, final thoughts for the panel. Dr. Sab, I would like to ask both you and Hassan that quite frankly, right now, we will never have the capacity. I would argue we would never have the capacity. Gonzalo's here. The World Bank has maybe 5,000 economists. Um, IMF has about 2,000 economists. WTO has another 2,000 economists. The international agencies have far more capacity than we'll ever have. And they have the resources to concoct these deals. So we've got 10,000 international rules that we are facing now. This is the problem with globalization. And this is why the whole world is having a huge difficult time that you know we have to react to so many rules that bureaucrats are concocting for themselves. Like as a research organization, I have to fight the fact that the World Bank has $5 million for one study. Our budget is less than a million dollars, right? How can we compete with them? There's no way. So the question is that if we continue to follow this path, the world is now collapsing on its own bureaucracy. You've seen that in Ricodec, for example, we lost the case, not because we should have lost the case, because somehow, you know, this was another political issue, but we won't go there. So the question is that with these international bureaucracy riding so high now, a country like us, can, can it ever have the capacity to compete? We'll run from free trade agreement to another one. And for Hassan, I'll ask you a simple question. You say you've done an evaluation of the free trade agreement, et cetera. So, but the point is free trade agreement assumes a certain static view of the future. You lock yourself into something. The world changes. The world changes all the time. How are we locking ourselves into the future with one country or two countries, technologies change, world changes, and we are locked into something. Then we have to negotiate another free trade agreement. 
is this a war that we can win or is the best thing to fix ourselves and go unilateral just open out and say guys okay i believe in openness just open out say guys we are open to trade with anybody we will trade period we'll reduce our barriers i don't see all these rules that we are setting up what are these rules doing for us can you please tell us are these rules to, i mean i noted down the 10000 things uh, content requirements source requirements this requirement what does it do why does why do we need all these man do so first you then hasan then we'll close Uh, thank you very much uh, dr nadeem you you're very right i mean the uh, the countries that have unilaterally opened up they they were very successful i mean they're small countries and they're countries exactly chile was a country just like us high tariffs and everything and then one government came they said hell with everything we'll just have 10% tariff across the chicago the boys remember <laughs> yeah he did that and there was a lot of lot of that but but you know then uh, and the government then the subsequent government tried to change it but then they realized it wasn't working because everybody came running in all right i want to have this protection this is and then they reduced it to 6% now chile has uh, this fts with everybody because you know it's, it's there's no tariff so there and and similarly is uh, you know, just talking about costa rica and how bad i mean they've negotiated with with everybody because they unless we do that our reform our own tariff we will never be able to negotiate with and then uh, one other point i let me make that we have these ftas we call them that we have with with, with china and everything and what what we do is under an fta you commit that this is where you then we put a regulatory duty additional duty on those ftas you cannot do this uh, you know this is not uh, but maybe china says okay they they don't care but that is not the way uh, you have in so so that's why we are not we are unable to make use of uh, any of the uh, uh, so th- i think that also answers the last, uh, last question you saying where, whether we have a political will no no there's no actually when we think in terms of bilateral that you know you should have uh, balance of trade in your favor if you if you keep thinking like that you cannot have trade i mean we for example i think with with all the middle east and every every country we 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 we, we always balances in their favor so you can't but you make for example uh, uh, let me give you example of uh, bangladesh india trade now bangladesh imports something like 7 8 billion dollars of uh, imports from india and exports only 1 billion but what it does is it gets all those raw materials and everything adds value exports it to the rest of the world so bangladesh may be from those 8 billion of imports makes 30 billion of exports that's the way to do it's not you that you start counting with each country that you know where we are. that was that was uh, president trump did it but i don't think they, you know that's the way to go um, i forget if there's any other question you can ask me again but let uh, asan uh, for its first uh, get okay. ji thank you doctor sir so uh, doc i totally agree with dr nadeem that liberalization is the way to go i do not uh, have any doubt about it whether how quickly can we be ready for the liberalization i think that remains open to opinion interpretation uh, and i think many of these fta's are also kind of taking us into that direction whether we like it or not i do feel though that uh, when we look at trade investment economic policies i look at the government and i see a lot of different moving pieces really moving on their own it does not look like a coherent machinery to me so for example if ministry of commerce is kind of incentivizing trade in one area that does not reflect into what board of investment is thinking and that definitely does not have anything to do with the conversations going on in ministry of industries and then of course there is fdr so i think it it becomes really sometimes it's mutually it has a mutually ca- cancelling effect unless of course in some sectors there is a push from the top right so right now we are running these ncoc models where there is a push to kind of bring in an integrated approach which i think does work in some cases i do think that perhaps it, it, it's not bad to have so many ministries but it's the role of ecc which needs to bring all this discussion uh into one piece of paper and say okay this is our vision and this is what we want to do and it should be more top down than bottoms up and i think unless we do that we'll 
keep on falling victim to these incoherent policies. Thank you, Doctor. Okay, thank you, Gonzalo. You should summarize it. Thank for you. Us. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make a, a two comments. So one is on on the capacity issue. So uh, capacity is endogenous to to the experience, right? So uh, Pakistan may not have the capacity that, for example, the British have or the Chinese have to negotiate, but but it will acquire the capacity as it negotiates. So it needs to build the muscle. Uh, and by building the muscle, it will acquire capacity. So the, 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 I, I echo what Hassan and what Anabel said before, the lack of capacity cannot be a, 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 an excuse. Uh, plus, I also agree with a, the, the, the trade and investment counselor in London saying, you know, we actually have capacity. So I think that's one point. And the other point I want to clarify is that, so the, the rules of RCEP or the rules of these regional trade agreements are not made by international institutions like WTO, the World Bank, or the IMF, they are not. So in, in the case of R RCEP, the rules are governing the agreement are made by, by the, the signatory countries. Probably larger countries are going to have more, more of a voice in those rules. Uh, but certainly this is not something that international institutions do. Now, in, in my opinion, in my humble opinion, if the World Bank has a lot of economists and the WTO has a lot of economists and the IMF has a lot of economists, then it, I wouldn't think of, you know, Pakistan needing to compete with them, but rather Pakistan uh, tapping into that opportunity or, 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 or leveraging uh, some experience that it could get from uh, advisory services and support from these institutions if it considers that that's appropriate, right? But, but I wanted to emphasize that these, the rules governing these regional trade agreements are not rules that are designed by, uh, by, by the IMF or the, or the World Bank. Uh, they are rules that are uh, designed by the signatory countries. Over, thank you. Fair enough, fair enough. Thank you, thank you. No, I think, Gonzalo, my point was very simple that uh, there's, uh, the, um, the world has become a global bureaucracy. And while we deregulate at home, the international bureaucracies suffer no such political pressure to deregulate. In fact, they're re-regulating all the time. While we re deregulated our financial sector, now the wind is blowing the other way and we are re-regulating our financial sector. <clears throat> we had deregulated the financial sector to make it easy for everybody to transact, to do business. Now the international agencies have come in through FATF and through many other things to make us re-regulate our financial system so that now nobody can get a bank account, nobody can get a credit card. Even I can't get a credit card or a bank account, Gonzalo. I have been told by banks that over 60, you can't get a credit card or a, or a bank account, right? Even I can't move money in and out of the country. And I remember the time, Gonzalo, when I was growing up, I was fond of comics and I could not get comics at home because there was an exchange control regulation. When I went abroad to study, the exchange control regulation would not give us currency to go abroad, right? We had to buy currency in the black market. And now you guys tell us black markets are wrong. I'm very happy with the black market because that's how I got educated. Otherwise I would have been sitting in Pakistan uneducated. So quite frankly, the international bureaucracy we have to put it in a, in, a, in a lens. And we have these ambassadors who go there, Mandusa was an ambassador. We have the World Bank EDs, et cetera, but they, 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 they have a vested interest to not challenge the status quo. So the question is the international bureaucracies are multiplying. They're multiplying dramatically. For example, there are agencies that now don't have any relevance, but they still exist. And they create these rules and regulations that are kind of blocking up the global system, which in a, in, in, at one point was open and getting more and more open. Now we are getting more and more close because international bureaucracies are coming out more and more reports to say, hey, do this, do that, do that, et cetera. I don't know whether we are better off or not. Um, there are other things to do, but when you have a bureaucracy, as Parkinson says, it does find work for itself. So these are complicated questions. We'll take them up next time, but this has been a great webinar. I hope we can get interest in research in, on these agreements, my hope is really to, by these webinars, to 
excite our people to do some research on these things. I think we need, that's how we will develop capacity. We will only develop capacity if we can do research on things on our own. Robert Lucas, the famous Nobel Prize winner, who was my uh, supervisor at one point and uh, you know, the dominant figure in the last century in economics, he, used, he told me one thing which still sticks with me very clearly. He said, whatever you do, you have to do a lot of problems to learn the subject. He said, when you learned algebra or Pythagoras' theorem, you did a lot of problems in that thing to learn it. If you didn't do the problems, you'll never learn it. The problem with Pakistan is if we don't do our own policy, we'll never learn. If we leave the policy to international consultants and international agencies to do, our capacity will die. And that's what we, has happened to us. We used to have a first-rate capacity to do business better than all developing countries. We staffed the World Bank. We staffed many agencies. But now we can't even staff ourselves. And that, that issue also has to be thought through and we are suffering because we have participated too much in globalization. Perhaps it's time to withdraw a little and say, look guys, we want to fix ourselves first, then we'll worry about globalization. But these are random thoughts. I don't, I'm not making any, any hard statement, but I think for research, we have to make some you know, critical questions. This was what Lucas Friedman, all these big guys taught me, ask questions. If you can't ask questions, you're going nowhere. So I implore all of us to ask questions, tough questions, doesn't mean that you have to agree with them. I don't agree with anything I say. I just say it because I want to ask a question. Okay, folks, all the best. We shall do it again soon. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you, Mansoor Sab. Thank you very much, Gonzalo, for arranging it. And I'll communicate to Annabelle. Thank you. Thank you all. All the best. Uh, Mansoor Sab wants to say something. Last word, Mansoor Sab, go ahead. Uh, just, just one little thing. Um, we, we discussed so much about this uh, capacity building. Uh, I give you an example of trade facilitation agreement. What it was that they said, okay, uh, uh, there, there were three lists and they said, what can you do yourself and how long you take it? And then what you cannot do and you need technical assistance. And Pakistan put most of the things, uh, anything that was even a little complicated, they said, we cannot do it unless we get technical assistance. On the other hand, India, Turkey, all other countries like us, they, they said, we don't need any technology, we'll do all these things ourselves. And, but, and then you have, you're, you're saying about Pakistanis uh, stuff, uh, all the technical assistance that they send over, for example, in the International Trade Center, the head of trade facilitation unit is a Pakistani, his desk office is a Pakistani, they're all Pakistani, they're going all over the world, training people about trade facilitation. And here we are, the FVR and they're saying, we cannot do it because until uh, you give it. And, and they put everything after 2022 that when we get technical assistance, we'll do it. Okay. Yes, no, no, you're absolutely right, Mandu Sab. I mean, you know, you know, this is my favorite subject, brain drain. Uh, I've been writing about it a lot. If you go to Wall Street, you'll find that the majority, not majority, but a large number of Pakistanis are sitting there, fund managers, chief investment officer, they're doing all kinds of things. They're really doing very well on Wall Street. If you go to Silicon Valley, there's a large number of Pakistanis sitting there doing very well. Now, so webinar that we're going to have on the 18th um, is with a famous oncologist, Pakistani, sitting in New York. She's changed the world in the way we think about cancer. But yet, in Pakistan, she has no room. Same thing, Ayub Umayya, for example, was a famous neurologist sitting in Washington, very famous neurologist, one of the world's best. He told me himself, he's dead now, poor fellow, a wonderful man, Renaissance man, well-read, just like Azra that we're going to talk to. She's a Renaissance lady, you know, all kinds of things, poet as well as an oncologist, world-famous oncologist, etc. cetera. Ayub Umayya told me he wanted to come back to Pakistan. And he applied to Mayo Hospital. And Mayo Hospital rejected him. King Edward Medical College rejected him. I mean, so yes, of course, there is a huge problem here. There's a problem. This is what I call the problem of disintermediation. We develop our intellect. We push them out. We don't keep them in the country. We don't want to keep them in the country. I get calls from students all over the world saying, I want to come back. And I tell them myself, please don't come back. We have no room for you. What can I give them? I can give them 100,000 rupees a month. What will that do for anybody? Right? The World Bank gives Hassan Khawar more. So what do I do? Right? So where does the capacity go? Capacity goes, even if they stay in the country, they become consultants to these guys. So, I mean, we have no capacity and we can't. So the answer lies in domestic reform. When Latin America developed Mandur Sahib, I mean, I, I have some memory of that. When Latin America developed, one thing I noticed, Latin America developed 
all those countries started developing when people started leaving the fund in the bank and going there and not coming back. I can name you so many good economists from the fund who left and the bank as well. I mean, Gonzalo can check that out too. They went and they uh, staffed their own governments and they developed their own governments. I mean, that's the way it'll happen. Ji Manzur go ahead. Lenny, I, I didn't ask you floor, but okay. I, I agree with you. I agree with you and, and uh, Yes, unfortunately, we're, for example, yeah, I'm one example. I was uh, WTO negotiating this trade federation agreement, everything. Not once FBR has ever asked me, do you have any views on this or how do we go? Ahead? Never, not even a, you know, uh, 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 yeah, even a Zoom conference. So that's, that's, that's how things are. So. That's the thing. Anyways, thank you very much, folks. All the best. Inshallah, we'll see you soon. You got a, all kinds of good webinars coming along because we want to continue this dialogue, develop it. Gonzalo, thank you. And Gonzalo, let's keep collaborating. Let's keep doing things. Thanks for this wonderful opportunity, Gonzalo, to learn about RCEP and learn about uh, Annabelle. All the best. See you, inshallah, soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.